We are in the book of Luke today, continuing with our series, the Eternal Route 66, looking at 66 books of the Bible over a period of many months to come. We are finishing, new, we've already done Old Testament, this is New Testament portion, and we'll do that, so... The last part of Matthew chapter 3 is serving as our, our text. In other words, what we're marching to, make his path straight. As That was the job of John the, um, the Baptist, to prepare the way for the Lord. And um, we are attempting in this series to, as we skim over, as we survey the New Testament, we learn a little bit about each book. Um, they are not going to be in depth because there's just, we've been going not even verse by verse and look how long it's taken us in Sunday school to just do the book of Matthew. So it is a uh, introduction. We're using the old Route 66 that um, most people are familiar with. Some of us are old enough to have, we have traveled it at some point in our lives uses as an illustration. And the sites we're looking at today come from the book of Luke. There are three pictures here. They all have something in common. Anybody know what those three things, those three pictures have in common? Well, we touched on this at another point, but we're going to do it again. It's Winslow, Arizona. So in Winslow, Arizona, there's a statue standing on the corner there. And there's a flatbed Ford out front. What you remember is, for those of us who like the Eagles, then you know that from a song. The famous lyrics of the Eagles Taking It Easy, written by Jackson Brown and Glenn Fry. The statue is Jackson Brown. That's who that is, if you get up close and see him. The man in those pictures was Howard Hughes, famous aviator and recluse. He spent some of his time, much of his time, in the La Posada at Winslow, Arizona, which was that motel-looking like thing. I find it quite often it's remarkable how close we can be to the historic, remarkable, and even the divine, yet miss it. We just aren't looking. And so was it when Jesus walked among us. How many people stood before God as judge and were reminded that just a few weeks earlier they had stood next to the Son of God while he walked this earth. Can you imagine? You mean that that's who I should have given my life to? And, of course, here we are all these many centuries later and it's still happening while well, Jesus gets presented to this community, to this world on an ongoing basis, most are not seeing it, not seeing him, not seeing the application to find him in this world or the importance. Sadly, they step off into eternity only to find out that they had an opportunity. I, I can't prove it by biblical verse that this happens, but it seems that as we are allowed to understand that there's a book of life and your name gets written in it, that surely there must be some illustration for the lost to understand that they could have had their name written in the book of life on maybe it's June 6th, 2021, right? So whatever that is or that day is, the opportunities, part of the torment of hell is going to be r the reminder that I didn't have to be in torment. 
And hell is literally a torment. There's nothing I can say today to anybody that would make hell sound like a place you want to visit. It's not going to matter that all your friends are nearby. It will be hot, it will be miserable, and it will not be a pleasant place. We're going to use the first four verses of Luke to uh, be our text this morning to begin with in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write unto thee, in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Let us again go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, for each one is here. And Lord, just uh, enrich in our lives for uh, having taken a few moments to look at this book. Guide us to have a deeper understanding and to read more of it and to read more of the remaining books of this study that we might understand how important it is that you gave us your word and how important it is for eternity. God, it's now in our study. We ask it in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to uh, chart Luke just a little bit. So here's some facts and some things about him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic meaning they're uh, similar, in sync with each other. They don't say the exact same things, but the stories are quite often similar to each other. Luke wrote to the Greeks. It is the only book in the entire New Testament written to a Gentile. His name is Theophilus, and we don't know anything about him. I have a book called Theophilus as a book of fiction, as some tradition has some ideas of who he may be, but we actually don't know very much about him. And it's written by a Gentile. Now I say that because of what's mentioned in Colossians chapter 4. Paul uh, writes and he writes and says these are the those of the uh, Jewish household and then he mentions Luke and Demas separately and so most people assume that they are not Jews. Now, by lineage and by things that are mentioned in the book of Luke, he may have had Jewish roots, but simply been considered Greek because of what's called the diaspora or the separation, the spreading of, the, of Judaism over the Greek empire. And some of them so adapted that lifestyle that they um, were not considered Jew, although the bloodline may have been. So... I say that according to uh, Colossians chapter 4, but one of these days when you're in heaven, you can ask Luke, okay? But in the meantime, we'll just take uh, this for him. Luke traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam, to, and I think to show his Gentile readers that the promise of a Savior predates the first Jew and originates with the Father of mankind. And that's Genesis 3.15, so... Um, the idea of the faith that's given to the Jewish people, there is a date even earlier than that. So Adam, was Adam Jewish? Adam had the familiarity of humanity and creation. Is he of genetic quality to be Jew? I don't know. And this is another one of those things. You can ask him when he gets there, along with checking out to see if he has a belly button or not. Right, because that's everybody else's questions about Adam. Did he have a belly button because he was the first one created? I don't know. You'll find out when you get there. In Luke's geolo genealogy, we see, since starts with Adam and finishes with Christ. So the reason we have the problem of sin and what conquers it. Luke's gospel is seemingly all about the God of glory coming down to our level. 
There's an old gospel song that uses that idea. He came down to our level because we can't get up to his. And so the Son of Man is mentioned, and he uses that in chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Son of Man means this is his earthly heritage. Jesus Christ was every bit man, yet he was also every bit God. But for man to understand him, he came down to be a part of him, and therefore this is what that, that uh, terminology has reference to. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, he is called Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, and that's another guy who was with him. So Luke is a doctor, he's a physician, not necessarily of the caliber of physicians today, but he probably had great training, particularly if he is of Greek um, heritage. He has an educated writing style and perhaps is the most qualified to write a book. So people who know linguistics a lot better than me almost always say his is perfect. It's, it's the way writers ought to write. You say, well, isn't it all perfect because it's inspired? Well, this is how inspiration works. Inspiration puts the, mind, the thoughts and mind of God into man who writes it in his style. And uh, are there errors? Are there, you know, there are in times of anybody's reading anything, punch, punctuation? Yes, there can be some things in the copies that are made, but we should understand that, you know, from the heart of God to the mind of man is uh, what inspiration is. And they are allowed to write in their style. If you could tell, and we can't because we don't know what it would have looked like, uh, but Luke's handwriting would have been his handwriting in one original copy. And from then on, it would be copied, and in the handwriting of those that copied the copy, and the copy, and the copy, and the copy, that which you have today. Not handwritten, but in print. And um, it is a great and wonderful copy that you have. Um, it is superintended by, the, by God to bring truth to us. And yet, we fully understand that he used man uh, to do that. At the time, or of the nature, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, revolutionized medicine, arguing that disease was not a punishment by the gods, but a product of environment, habits, age, and disease itself. Although microbiology had yet to prove germs, he had an understanding of there must be something I can't see causing you to get sick. And plus, quit eating all the chocolate or whatever, right? So uh, all those sorts of things. I'm sure he didn't say that about strawberries. But nevertheless, he was a, you know, the father of this. He's the one that doctors quote, right? Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, to do no harm, which I find to be uh, onerous in this world in which those that contribute to and take into hand uh, the abortion of children. Do no harm. Abortion is um, taking a life, and I believe that very strongly. Also at this time uh, was an understanding of the philosophers who were largely Greeks. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and others who wanted to rationalize the whole world. You can still get a doctor of philosophy degree, and sometimes it is literally about studying the philosophers. The Greeks were creative thinkers who pursued studies in a precise and systematic manner. And their sense of scientific accuracy in the recording of history is well developed. So Dr. Luke interviews as many eyewitnesses accounts and visits as many locations as he can. And his resulting gospel is as close to a modern biography as existed in his day. I'll quote that from Bruce. Uh, worsen. So Luke presents a doctrinal statement, a systematic theology, if you will, when compared to the other Gospels and most of the books of the New Testament, this is a masterpiece in writing. So let's let the physician speak. 
That which you see on your screen is an ancient portion of the book of Luke. A, not a copy, a photocopy or whatever, a scanned copy of a fragment of Greek text. And it is from the book of Luke. And yes, you can say it looks like Greek to me. Because it is. So letting the physician speak. He begins this book, and why really this is the, uh, uh, a place we want to kind of plant in our understanding of this book. He says that there was a need for a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. In our quarterly, uh, our fellowship of churches has chosen to put our doctrinal statement in the front and the back cover of the uh, quarterly. We agree with that doctrinal statement. And... Uh, fellowship with the Churches of the American Baptist Association, who, uh, for the most part, uh, believe those same basic qualities of doctrine. And we say, you use that verse, that this is a declaration. This verse, in this section of verse, is the premise for the use of what we call creeds, doctrinal statements, articles of faith, etc., and yet, and so, you know, what defines your faith? Well, of course, God and Scripture, not a creed, uh, is definitive. So while I believe everything on that doctrinal statement, I'm not to study the doctrinal statement. I'm to study the Word of God, and the statement or the doctrinal statement, the creed in which we follow, is a concise rendering, um, which is good to have, but I've, I've seen some churches post on their websites just pages of explanation of their doctrinal statement, you know? Just, just say what you believe. A biblical proof is good. If you want to discuss it in greater detail, let's get to the book that you really need to be in. And so that would be this. Then get out your Bible and learn more about those things. Because I can't say in a few words everything that that doctrinal position implies. There are some things that make us different. What makes us, what we have on our sign out here, Missionary Baptist. That's a traditional name. Uh, it's a name that probably in this day and age doesn't mean a whole lot. And in some places, Missionary Baptist... Uh, is on every sign, and very few of them are from the fellowship that we're in. Uh, a great deal of them are uh, in the South, um, are from the National Baptist Association, which is a predominantly black uh, fellowship of churches. And they also use quite regularly the name Missionary Baptist. The idea came out, and the use of that is to combat what was called hard shellism of the 1800s. Hartshellism is a hyper-Calvinism belief that some people can be saved only because God predetermined that they could be and nobody else can qualify. Well, that's a heresy, and we stand firmly against that. We believe that anyone, everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ and believes can be saved. And we, we believe that because that's part of Scripture and it's part of our doctrinal statement. And uh, we want to say that as opposed to someone who might misunderstand that. Hardshellism said, we don't need to send missionaries because they're going to get saved whether we go or not. And a lot of churches begin using missionary in their name to understand that we do believe in going out and winning souls for Christ, and so we use the term missionary. I'm not opposed to it. Baptist is just fine. And that even is of a fairly recent origin as far as a name goes. Uh, the Church of God of Scripture, it is not the Church of God today in modern times, but that simple understanding, the Lord's Church, that would have been sufficient for your sign uh, back in the old ancient days. What are we saying? We are the Church. We are still the Church. Matthew, uh, as we studied, chapter 16, chapter 18, both give us understanding of the launching, the beginning, the starting of the New Testament Church, and the Church is still here today. It's a perpetual thing. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 said that, that the Lord would build his church, 
and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so in 2021, there's a promise of the Lord's church to be able to be found. You can find it. And you find it by quick searching of those doctrinal statements. Compare it, and you can determine that. So we need not shy away from the beliefs that make us unique among the religions of our time, as did Luke. So he's wanting to make sure Theophilus, who may have been a young believer, you have some doubts of whether this thing we've been teaching you is true. Well, we're eyewitnesses. We've been here from the beginning. And so I'm going to give you, essentially, a systematic theology uh, that will, over 24 chapters, prove to you that what I've been telling you is true. Now, only, Luke, only the physician tells us some things. Stories, particular kinds of stories that, and this may not be a full and complete list, I figured that if I could tell you everything that's different in Luke, we would have to do this over two or three weeks, and so I'm condensing it down. I'm trying very hard to do this in 20 minutes to let you know everything is different. And uh, you want to prove me wrong? You don't have to worry about it. Study it and see. There are other things. This is not a full list, but there are things I thought you might find interesting. First of all, that uh, the, the physician tells us Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, prodigal son, and the Pharisee and the publican. He tells us about a hated chief tax collector named Zacchaeus who climbed a tree to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And here's that story in Luke chapter 19, verses 5 through 10. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said it unto the Lord, Behold, the Lord, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have, if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Zacchaeus is just a long line of sinners. Comes right through my household, came through my family, ran through your house and your family. And whether they have accepted Jesus Christ or not, the penalty of sin has been running rampant through our world. And there's one reason that we can defeat it, well, only one way to conquer it, and it, that is by accepting Jesus Christ, who came to be our Savior. He's what's prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. Only the song of Mary and then Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, uh, the contemplations of Mary is called a song, but it's a thing she's thinking of in her heart. And um, would it be pretty easily to put it into a, a song, I think. The story of Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem and giving birth in a stable, in a feed trough, quite literally. About the angel appearing to the humble shepherds and announcing him as Savior. About old Simeon, moved by the Spirit, proclaiming Jesus as Savior and light to the Gentiles at Jesus' dedication in the temple. About Mary and Joseph searching for the 12-year-old Jesus and finding him reasoning with the teachers in the temple. About a fuller story of the Roman centurion who sent word ahead to ask Jesus to give a healing order and had faith knowing it would be so. And that even while Jesus hung, up, hung dying on the cross... He was extending kindness, compassion, and salvation to a common criminal who was saved the same way as you, uh, as, as you and I, by faith in the Son of Man who died to pay the penalty of sin. He says unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today 
shalt thou be with me in paradise. What else did he have to do? What could he do? The thief nailed to the cross. What possibly could he do in good works to earn his way into paradise, into the place of the redeemed spirits? Why would he be able to access that place? Because he in his humility, questioning the pride of the other thief, says, Remember me. By faith. He knew there was something different about him. By faith, I'm sure he was quite aware of Jesus already. Jesus was uh, prominent in the cities of Palestine of the time. The story about the risen walking, Jesus walking and talking to unsuspecting disciples on the Emmaus Road then convincing the frightened disciples that he was still Jesus, now glorified. A, a story that takes, makes me smile a little bit, to be walking with the resurrected Jesus and not know. Were they so unaware? Did he look so different glorified than he did in his uh, flesh before? Whatever it was, they were doubtful that they would see Jesus again. They saw him die and yet here he was walking with them. Scared them a little bit. But uh, what an opportunity. And the, at the end of the book, Jesus says through Luke, these things, Luke 24, 36 through 48, out by again the seas of Galilee. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. Does that sound familiar? Didn't we just read that this morning? They were those disciples thinking they're seeing ghosts all over the place, right? Unusual to see a man walking on water, we studied this morning in Sunday school. Unusual to see a man walking by the side of the sea after he had been crucified. But here he was, again. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. I don't know much about the glorified body, but I know that when we are reconstructed sometime in glory, we're going to look a lot like we do today. Some of us may say, oh, that's a shame. But also, uh, it's just how we are. And we're all parts of, and partakers of God's wonderful gift of life. Although, I will be in the improved Gary McFarland body at that time. And uh, the one that will not need some of the care that it takes these days. And will function as it should. And he tells them, touch me. You think it's not me now? Touch me. You thought Thomas was the only one that needed proof. He's not. We, we're critical. We're going doubting Thomas. Thomas said, oh, I don't know. Touch my hands. Here's all the disciples. Come on. Touch my hands. See the... I'm real. Jesus Christ is real. He is as real today as he's ever been, and he is alive in the presence of of Almighty God the Father, in the physical presence of Him, as He was on that day by walking on the shore of Galilee. When you see Him one day, when we stand in His presence, you're going to see the same person that these disciples saw on this day. And when He had thus spoken, He showed them His hands and His feet, and while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? 
And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. This, of course, is the favorite dinner of some here, right? Who doesn't love broiled fish? Oh, well, a few of you don't. Maybe. <laughs> well, take the honeycomb then, I'm sorry. But what's the point? They still had a little bit of doubt. They're joyful. Is it, is it really, really him? For crying out loud, give me something to eat. He ate. You mean we're going to eat in glory? I don't know that we have to eat for sustenance, but the ca capacity is. In fact, even read about the accounts about the New Jerusalem. There are trees that bear fruit. There are some apples. I'm personally, a, you know, haven't we come up with some great varieties of apples? There's some weird names, but one of my favorites that's been on the market not too, too long is a thing called Honeycrisp. I love those things. And, of course, they're about the most expensive apple with it figure that you can buy. What do you think an apple by in the eternal Jerusalem would taste like? Wouldn't it be sweet? It would be perfect. I don't know what fruit. I don't even know if we bear and we eat for sure. All of those things are questions to contemplate about our eternal home. But I know this, that this is the real Jesus that appears to these disciples, and he wants them to understand it, and wants them to to solve this problem for them. Quit doubting. Stop the doubts. Put your faith. Get it resolved. And almost all of these men go out and plant churches throughout Europe and Asia and in Palestine. They're the first missionaries. Remember we talked about apostle. The root word of apostle means to be sent on a mission. They were really missionaries. They've just been in seminary for a few years at the hands of Jesus Christ, and now they're going to go out and really minister. And they needed to have no doubts about whom they were speaking about when they went into the world around them. It's a wonderful thing to think of how Jesus Christ gives this whole book and builds us all up and right here, while we think the disciples have a problem, you know this is really written to Theophilus. Remember that? We started the book. Theophilus is who the book's written to. You and I get the profit from it. Millions have profited from the reading of it. But that original copy was put into the hands of a guy named Theophilus. For him to have faith. It's personal. It's profitable. It's poignant. And there's a place for it in your life and my life today. I, again, don't know much about Theophilus, but by this time, he should have been firm in the faith. Continuing that text, he says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Now he has told them this before. He's explained it. He's wept over the the future of Jerusalem and the things that the disciples will have to go through. 
He asked the Father to protect them because they don't know what they're up against. And some of the last words that he speaks to them, according to Luke, is to help them understand this is a serious business in which you have now become a part of. Take heed, all nations. Theophilus, is this good for you? Yep, Theophilus is all nations. Gentile, sometimes Gentile and Greek are used interchangeably, meaning everybody that's not Jewish. And who's responsible? Well, Luke's responsible, at least in part, because ye are witnesses. You've been with me this whole journey, and now be a witness. When he says that remission in sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and the year are witnesses of these things, we find this, we can take these things from that. It's the good news for all nations, for the Gentiles. So the idea of what this book is centered on focusing on, the Gentiles, it's good for them. He says, beginning in Jerusalem, begin where you are, where you live. The gospel begins not when we get somewhere to start talking about Jesus Christ. Talking about Jesus Christ starts where we live and where we are. Jerusalem, Madras, 1112 Southwest Highway 97, space number 23. That's where I have to begin every day with the good news. Is there good news that comes out of that trailer spot? Well, I hope so, because it's my duty to bring it every day, wherever I go, whatever I do. Put, insert your address as the home place for Jerusalem. It begins where you live. Witnesses are attesting to the facts he says, from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He said that in chapter 1. You were there from the beginning. You were an eyewitness. Tell them what you saw. People say, I'm just not very good about explaining the Bible. Well, I don't carry a Bible with me every day. And if you're like me, my memory of what I would love to be have memorized, wouldn't it be lovely I could just, you know, program something in and it'd come out scripture. It's not like that. But what I can tell anyone, anytime, anywhere, is my witness, my eyewitness. Well, this is what I know. I came to the realization that I needed Jesus Christ as Savior. And for me, that was talking to a pastor about it, making sure I was correct in what I was talking about. He read to me some verses. He read to me Ephesians chapter 2. He read to me John 3.16. In a little Baptist church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Sunnyside Missionary Baptist Church, on a Monday night, I believe it was, I went in, and during the coffee break of classes that they were having at the time, we went into a, a dressing room for the baptistry, much like you see here on either side of this stage. And we sat down, I sat down with uh, my girlfriend at the time and the pastor, and I prayed a prayer for the Lord to forgive me of my sins and to come and live in my heart. And I believed it. And I still believe it that that happened that night. That's my eyewitness account. That's the truth to me of when it became real to me. Now the Lord's speaking to you and speaks to the people in our community. Share our story, how we came to know the Lord. Regardless of background, 
whether you were raised in a religious family or not, whether you came to the faith of Jesus Christ because you heard it from a child or whether you heard it from a girlfriend or whether you heard it from the preacher from a pulpit or whether you read it on a piece of paper. Share it. Share these things. The certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. What were you writing Luke about? Chapter 1. These things. That's everything that Luke talks about are the things that are important to talk about. What can you leave out of Scripture and it's no big deal? A few years back, Reader Digest, who makes a living off of condensing books, thought that they would come out with a condensed Bible. It hardly sold. It didn't sell at all to the Christian community because the Christian community understood what did you take out? You can't have a condensed Bible. What you need is the whole Word of God. And even in a survey like we're doing here today with the book of Luke, touching on highlights, it is not sufficient for your understanding to say, I've now read the book of Luke because Brother McFarlane taught it on Sunday morning. It's not sufficient for me to say we're studying the book of Luke. It's only sufficient for you to read it yourself and to read all 66 and to become familiar with it. But do know there's certainty in those things. And you're an eyewitness The very final words of the book of Luke are these. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. The details that, uh, that Luke chooses to give are not as great as what you find in the beginning of the book of Acts and some other things that others give. But I thought it's very interesting that he records what the disciples did from this point on. That they go, oh great, it's all over now. He's gone. That's not what they did at all, is it? They had great joy. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And what did they do daily? They were down at the Temple Baptist Church. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of Baptist churches use the name Temple in it. The Temple represents a place for the gathering of God with his people. Our equivalent today is to be about a mindset of worship. And we're praising and blessing God. And the word amen. We have a little amen person here, attends here now. And she says verily every time she says that. It's like saying, that's right. And some people do that. I've been in revival services and there's people all over the building going, that's right. Preach it. You don't hear that much anymore. Probably preachers would preach themselves to death if they got very much of that. They'd get too excited and die of a heart attack. But amen means that. Verily. That's right. That's the final word. That's right. All of this is right. Theophilus. You can trust it all. And so the question is put on it, perhaps on the Theophilus, and it's put on to us. Assess yourself. Do the inventory. Do you have great joy? If not, why not? You have every reason to have as much joy as those disciples did. Are you continually of a mind to worship? 
Or do you get discouraged? And you don't want to be in church. You don't want to be around the people of God. Why is that? Because it certainly wasn't the early church. They can't get enough. Is your mind on the blessing of what has transpired? Can you say amen? If you can't, why not? Frankly, what we have to be today is understanding that this is a blessing that has happened and is still happening. Oh, the event we read about happened. It's historical to us, but it's nevertheless current and valid for my day-to-day life. One of the ways we can apply scripture is to say, how am I different today for reading this than I was before I read it? You apply scripture to your life. It's one thing to just read it and said you have, you've read it. I've read the Bible, I don't know how many times. And then I've studied the Bible. There's a difference. Well, you, well, you're the preacher. You're, it's, your, it's your job. You wouldn't take it very kindly if I got up and said, you know, just didn't have any time this week. Uh, Karen, you want to preach? <laughs> We'd all go, what? Huh? What did he just say? <laughs> Not going to happen. Although she preaches through the week, I can tell you. She's a great preacher. I see that, and I have learned to say amen. (laughs) But the point is, of course, putting it in our hands means be an eyewitness, be responsible with it, to do what we can. And so we become stewards of this that's been given to us. Luke did a good job. He was a good steward to present this to Theophilus in a letter form, and we're still reading it to this day. Amen. Now, what will you do with it? 